Hey everyone, Mike from vSwitch0 here, and today it's time for another build-off video. Uh, for anyone not familiar with these build-offs, they're basically a friendly community event where people build retro PC systems to celebrate a certain era of computing history. It gives anyone interested an opportunity to showcase some of their favorite parts to build uh, and to build some unique and interesting systems. So a number of us on Twitter have been doing this for probably the last year or so, and it's uh, been a lot of fun. We've done slot 1 build, socket 7, socket A, and even an overclocking focused build off more recently. But in this case, the era is one of my favorites. This is the 486 build off. And if you've ever watched some of my past videos, you'll know that 486s have a very special place in my heart. Really, it's kind of too bad this didn't happen a few months earlier because I actually just did a three part series on my custom 486 gaming rig that I use uh, on a daily basis. And uh, be sure to check out the description if you'd like to learn more about that build. But hey, that's okay. I'm always up for another 486 build, that's for sure. So even though I've got plenty of boards, CPUs, etc., I'm not going to be building or upgrading an AT system today. Nope. I'm going to do something a little bit different. I'm going to try to transform a very boring 1990s thin client into a small form factor DOS gaming powerhouse. No more boring remote desktop and terminal emulation connections for you little thin client. We are going to unleash your full potential. So this is the Viewpoint TC by Boundless Technologies, more specifically the TC325. I actually bought this system on a bit of a whim over a year ago. It looked like it had some potential, and for only 40 bucks, I thought it was worth a go. Uh, back then I just powered it up to make sure it works, but it's been sitting in storage ever since. So I've seen similar Boundless Technology system used for other purposes too, not just thin clients, including some low power network appliances and firewalls and things like that. So if this was out in 98 or 99, that's really the late Pentium 2 or early Pentium 3 era. But this system here uses a pretty legendary CPU that was released a few years earlier, the AMD AM 5X86 P75, a chip that I've talked uh, quite a bit about in some of my other videos. So even though the name seems to suggest that it's a 586 Pentium equivalent, it's actually a true 486 CPU, just with a really high 133 megahertz clock speed. And although AMD initially released it back in late 95, it turned out to be a very useful low power CPU for all sorts of embedded systems. And because of this, AMD actually continued to make these CPUs for quite a few years. After all, why use expensive high power P3s when a 486 is really all you need for this purpose? So the system itself is a rather uninspiring looking beige box, really, with nothing but an LED and a power switch on the front. There's also a very uh, thin slot that you can see here that's for an optional smart card reader, but uh, this system doesn't include it. But we're, what really sets the system apart is its size. It may not look very small to today's standards where, you know, we've got Raspberry Pis and, you know, all-in-one systems and things like that. But for the time, this thing was very small compared to your typical tower or desktop. It's only about six centimeters tall and 30 centimeters deep, or two and a half by 12 inches for the Americans out there. So moving on to the back, we can see there's a full complement of ports here from around the time. You've got uh, PS2 mouse and keyboard, which is great. A lot of 46s don't have that, which means you can use an optical mouse, which is definitely a bonus. You've also got your uh, two serial ports here. You've got a uh, parallel port and also in a uh, network uh, port here as well. There's a network card in this thing, which is great. And you can see there's a couple of uh, slot openings here, and I'll talk uh, more about that uh, in a bit. So moving inside, we can see a very clean and accessible layout here, and really that's because there isn't much here that isn't built right into the motherboard, really. The AM5x86 CPU is sitting under a pretty decently sized passive heatsink, and uh, the CPU isn't socketed, it's actually a PQFP surface mount package that's soldered right onto the board. There uh, really aren't very many jumpers on the board at all, but I did find this one here that seems to set the FSB frequency. I tried every combination. I was able to get 25, 33, and even 27 and 30 megahertz, which is kind of odd. But uh, sadly, there's no way to get 40 megahertz, at least not without modding the board somehow. So for a chipset, the system uses the uh, Acer or ALI 1487-1489. It's a very late PCI-based 46 chipset and a pretty good one overall. Acer actually nicknamed this one the Finally chipset. Uh, it seems to perform well and has a lot of built-in features for the time. The M1489 chip has the memory and cache controller on it, and it takes care of the PCI-based functions. And the M1487 is an ISA bus controller that includes a built-in RTC and even has a keyboard controller too. Interestingly though, I'm not sure why, but Boundless decided not to connect the keyboard pins, and there's actually a VIA keyboard controller chip here that's used instead. 
So the system has both a PCI slot and an ISA slot, but as you can see, only the ISA slot came with the required riser. And unfortunately, the non-standard height of these means that you can't just use a regular 90 degree riser here. They do appear to be proprietary, so that means that the PCI slot in this system is pretty much unusable. But hey, that's okay. I don't really care too much about that. But what I do care about is the ISA slot because every DOS gaming rig really needs a good sound card. And having an ISA slot available means that there'll be some good options. And I'll talk more about sound for this thing in a bit. So since I can't install a video card of my choice here, I'm really happy to report that the onboard video on this thing is actually quite good. It has a Cyrus Logic GD5446, a PCI-based chipset that's known to be a pretty good performer that also has great DOS compatibility too. It only has one megabyte of uh, memory here, but for DOS gaming, that should be perfect. And uh, there's only one jumper nearby that I did find that seems to have traces that connect to it, which seems to disable the onboard video. And I guess that makes sense since there is a PCI slot here. If you did have a riser, you could disable that and install your own, but I'm definitely gonna take advantage of the onboard video. It's great and perfect for this purpose. So for memory, the system has two memory slots and it came with a single stick installed. It's actually a 16 megabyte, uh, 60 nanosecond EDO stick. So yeah, EDO, most 486s support FPM only, but a few of the newer chipsets like the uh, M1489 do indeed support EDO. I'm not sure how much of a performance benefit it would really provide in a 486, but uh, still great nonetheless. So on the storage front, the system has a single 40-pin IDE header down here, and uh, that's definitely going to come in handy. And there's also a 36-pin floppy connector here too. And really, even though there's nowhere in the system to mount a floppy drive, it could still come in handy. You could mount one externally just for your initial setup and that sort of thing. But um, that's not all on the storage front. This system is actually meant to be an all-flash uh, setup, uh, which was often the case with embedded systems. You want to, you know, reduce the amount of uh, moving parts in the system and keep it as uh, reliable and maintenance-free as, as possible. So you can see right here that there's actually two AMD flash chips soldered right onto the board. Each one is two megabytes in size for a total of four megs. Yeah, really not a lot, but you know, for some of these embedded systems, it was certainly enough for the OS and the applications that are needed. But uh, this system here doesn't just have that. There's actually another flash drive on here and it's actually hidden back here behind the riser. So yeah, as you can see, this is a bit more than a pin to pin riser card. There's a little bit more going on here. And on the back, you can see that there's a DIP32 plastic uh, coated IC, which is known as a disk on chip module made by a company called M Systems. And these were actually pretty popular back in the day for embedded systems and industrial systems but it's actually not an IDE drive. It's directly connected to the ISA bus if you follow the uh, traces here. And that's because it has its own flash storage controller and boot ROM built in. There's uh, even a jumper here on the front so that you can change the uh, memory address block for the uh, flash controller too. I wish I could say, you know, it was a lot larger than the onboard flash, but um, unfortunately it's only eight megs. And uh, I'm assuming this was added uh, as an option for use cases where the four megs on the board just wasn't enough. And in fact, when I first got the system, I noticed that there was about six megs used on this drive for the OS and all the software. So another nice bonus on this system is the integrated uh, network card here. So thin clients obviously need network connectivity, so it made sense for them to include it on the board. It's based on a chipset I really haven't heard of, the Davicom 9008. And following the traces, it appears to be connected to the ISA bus. And there is a, uh, an unmarked header nearby. I did test it and it does seem to disable the, uh, the ethernet card if you don't wanna use it. But thankfully it's DOS compatible and the required packet driver was sitting on the onboard flash storage. So when it comes to power, the system has a completely internal power supply, which is great. No big power bricks to trip over and that sort of thing. And it's also totally passive with no fans anywhere. From what I can see, it does provide 5 volt, 12 volt, and negative 12 volt rails only. There is not a negative 5 volt rail in the system, so some older sound cards that require one probably aren't an option. But uh, that should be an issue for me. I'm uh, not sure what its total power rating is because it isn't listed anywhere, but the label on the back says the system can draw about 100, uh, 1.5 amps from the wall. So if we consider around 75% efficiency, that's probably about 130 watts or so. Really doesn't sound like much, but hey, more than enough for a small flash-based system like this. 
So there is a small opening here for a 40 millimeter fan, which is actually really great. And I'm going to install one to improve the cooling in this system here. But uh, it seems to be designed for a 10 millimeter width uh, 40 mil fan. You just slide it right in here and there's some notches that kind of hold it in place here. There is a, a fan header back here. It's a two pin header, but I did try it out and you can actually connect a three pin uh, fan connector to it. You just sort of offset the pins a bit and it fits just fine there. Provides 12 volt power to the fan. The way it works is when the cover's on, it sort of covers this opening here and you're basically sucking air in from the uh, where the power supply is and just providing a little bit of airflow here. So I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I do have a uh, Noctua fan that I hope to install here just to provide a little bit of airflow. The uh, thing with these systems is, you know, when you're doing RDP sessions and stuff like that, it's really not a lot of load on the system. But uh, if you're going to be playing Doom and things like that, it's definitely a little bit harder on the video card, on the CPU, and uh, the system may not quite have been designed for that type of load. So uh, putting the fan, even just for a very small amount of airflow, will probably help with uh, stability and longevity and things like that. So I talked a lot about what the system does have, you know, just about everything a larger PC would really, but what's missing? There's got to be some sacrifices in a small system like this, right? Well, aside from the obvious lack of a floppy drive and optical drive, you know, something that can be pretty easily worked around on the software side of things, there are a couple of other less obvious things missing here as well. So first of all, there's no L2 cache at all on the board. It probably just didn't increase performance enough to be justified for its use case as a thin client. And SRAM, you know, was quite expensive after all. But to be honest, the high clock speed of the M5 x86 and the fact that it's got 16K of right back L1 means it's gonna run circles around just about any 486 anyway, including a DX266 and probably even a DX4100 regardless of the cache. But I'm definitely gonna run some benchmarks to compare it to a more typical 486 system. Secondly, there's no RTC battery anywhere to be found in this system, both a positive and a negative, I think. No battery to leak, no battery to replace, which I'm sure the manufacturer loved, but as expected also, no date and timekeeping either. It's 1988 every time this thing powers on. Really not a problem for a thin client, which you know would normally be connected to the network and sync up its time using NTP. But really, there's no reason you can't sync up the time in DOS as well using NTP if you don't mind keeping it plugged into the network. Thankfully though, the system does appear to keep its BIOS settings, even without a battery. I did uh, actually consider adding an RTC battery to the system, which should actually be quite doable. I found the data sheet for the ALI 1497, and pin 12 is used for the VBAT input. Simply provide somewhere between three and five volts on that pin, and the clock should be kept. There's actually a small VIA nearby that could be used to solder a thin lead to, but the uh, pin does have five volts on it with the system powered on. So that means I'd need to add a little diode to the wire to prevent current from flowing back into the battery. And um, I just wanted to also give a quick shout out to Necroware as well. He was kind enough to discuss my plan with me and gave me some tips as well about how to proceed. I uh, may consider doing this mod in the future, but for now, because the BIOS settings are kept, I just didn't think it was really worth the trouble for just the date and the time, to be honest. So maybe a project for another rainy day. So yeah, it's pretty neat that a box like this from around 1998 has all flash storage, but let's face it, 12 megabytes ain't gonna cut it, so IDE storage it is. Um, there really isn't space for mechanical drive in here, and really I wouldn't want to put more load on the power supply, dump more heat in the case with one anyway, not to mention the noise, so I really think that this system's a perfect candidate for a compact flash to IDE adapter like this. I'm um, not 100% sure how uh, large of a drive this system can support, but uh, I did test two gigs and it works just fine. Really, that's plenty for a DOS gaming rig. And in addition, that's the maximum size of a FAT16 partition, so I think it's a good size and it makes sense. Um, I don't have a PCI riser to make use of the second slot, as I mentioned, so I'm going to mount the adapter there. Having one accessible outside of the case is really great too, because it's super easy to copy files to and from the system without having to open it up. And it's in this case too, it's especially handy because there's no floppy or optical drive here. And the good thing too is, you know, you can have more than one compact flash card too, swap them out. You can have one for pure DOS, one for Windows 95 perhaps, just gives you a lot of flexibility. And really with uh, 12 megs of uh, onboard flash storage too, it may not sound like much, but you can still make use of it. If you're gonna be swapping compact flash cards around, it is handy to keep some drivers and utilities permanently mounted there that you'll need. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. So one thing you'll notice with this case, there's no support or anything to hold the bottom part of the bracket. So it sits rather precariously in here. Um, I did drill a small hole in the bracket itself so that you can put a 
basically a nut and bolt through there just to hold it in place. Some PCI uh, and ISA expansion cards actually do have a hole there. I actually drilled it a little bit off center so that I can make the whole thing sit a little bit lower in the slot, just to give it a little more clearance here from the uh, top of the shell. But basically what I'm gonna do here, I'm just gonna loosen this real quick. And I should be able to just put a nut and bolt right through here to hold it in place and it should be much more solid. Just tighten that one up and now it's very solid. It's not going anywhere. So for the IDE cable, I basically just rounded one that I cut off here. It used to have two IDE connections on it. I chopped one off so that it's uh, pretty much the right size there. I'm just going to hook this up real quick here. But basically I wanted to keep it away from the heat sink just for heat and to make sure I don't obstruct any airflow here. But uh, I think it fits perfectly. Looks really good. There we go. So with our compact flash to ID adapter mounted, we encounter another problem. How the heck am I supposed to power this thing up? This system doesn't have a single Molex or floppy power connector in sight. Thankfully, while I was trying to find more info on the system, I came across a helpful Vogons thread. And in the photos there, I could see that there was indeed an optional six pin to Molex adapter that connects to a header on the board. Good luck finding the cable though. They're non-standard and pretty much impossible to find these days. So this is the six pin header right here. And I did some poking with a multimeter just to double check the pin out. And it looks a little something like this. It's got a single 12 volt pin, two five volt pins, two grounds, and even a negative 12 volt pin if you ever needed one. I had originally thought about hacking up a Molex and floppy connector here, but since the only thing that's gonna need power is just the compact flash adapter, I decided to wire up a very simple DuPont connector like this instead. So one side of this is six pin and the other side is four pin. Uh, I've only included two conductors, just uh, five volt and ground, which are the only two that the compact flash adapter uses anyway. Um, conveniently, the spacing on uh, a DuPont connector fits perfectly on both the header on the board and on the Berg uh, or floppy connector on the uh, compact flash adapter. So just a quick word of warning though, um, this is definitely not the quote unquote proper way to do this. DuPont connectors can very easily be hooked up in reverse and that's never a good thing for power connectors, that's for sure. Thankfully, there's only two of the four pins soldered on the compact flash adapters uh, power connection anyway, five volt and ground. So if this side were to be reversed, the adapter just wouldn't get power, nothing bad would happen. But unfortunately this side, the five volt and ground, if this got reversed, um, it would definitely cause some kind of a short and wouldn't be a good thing. So I'm gonna have to be very careful about that. I am gonna put a very small label next to the header just as a reminder to myself or to anybody else in case uh, this ever changes hands at some point in the future. Um, another thing to keep in mind too is that the wiring that's compatible with uh, DuPont connectors is very thin stuff. I think it's like 24 gauge or 26 gauge or something like that. Definitely not as thick as the usual 18 or 20 gauge stuff that power supplies use. So. Totally fine for a low power uh, flash drive like this one, but you would not want to use this with any heavier duty accessories. Not like you would in a system like this anyway, but just nonetheless, be very cautious if you ever do decide to do something like this. So yeah, as you can see, it fits perfectly on there. No problems at all. It doesn't quite sit all the way down, but it goes probably 90% of the way and it, it's held in there quite securely. It's not gonna fall out or anything like that. And then on the side with the floppy connector, again, it fits perfectly into a Berg uh, style connector there. And there we go. All right, so next up, sound cards. So I've got more than a dozen ISA sound cards, but unfortunately the system size really limits the card length that you can use. You've only got about 22 centimeters or a little less than nine inches up to this point here where it'll start blocking the card. So surprisingly that rules out the majority of my cards, um, but I did still have quite a few that I could use. I really wanted to use this card here. This is the Compact Business Wavetable Sound Card. Bit of a funny name, but it's a great ESS audio drive based card with the ES692S one megabyte wavetable chip. So sadly, I ran into some kind of weird conflict that I just couldn't figure out with this card. Some games like those based on the Doom engine would work just fine, but many other games like Wolf 3D, Tyrion, Commander Keen, they'd all just hang every time they launched. So troubleshooting conflicts on a system like this can be quite tough because there really isn't much you can configure in the BIOS or via jumpers. So I just sort of had to pick my battles and I don't think it was really worth uh, troubling over too much and I decided to go with a slightly different card instead. 
So this one here is a more basic ESS audio drive card instead. I really like ESS cards and this one's based on the ES1869 chip. I did consider using a smaller sound blaster, but this card here really checks all the right boxes in my books. It's got uh, great compatibility, great FM synthesis, it has a wavetable header, and even a bug-free MPU 401 interface too. Just a great all-around card for a DOS rig, and I think it's pretty perfect for this system. It is a bit of a budget card, so it only has a single output jack on the back. But if you look here, there are some jumpers that are here, so you can switch between amplified and non-amplified line out, which is great. All right, so this thing's pretty much ready to go. I've got the sound card installed in the ISA slot. I've got the Noctua fan installed here now, so should have some a little bit more cooling for the system. I'm just going to put the case back on, and we're ready to go. So the first thing you'll notice when you power this thing up is there's no text output at all as far as the post messages and stuff, and I'll get more to that in a bit. But if you mash on F2, you will get into the Phoenix BIOS here. And unfortunately, it's pretty trimmed down. There's not a lot of options to really set. You can see here that there are some uh, storage options for the IDE uh, drives. The auto uh, detection feature does work. It detected my two gig uh, compact flash card just fine. Uh, you can set the geometry manually if you wanted to. There's also a few performance things there. You've also got your uh, memory shadowing set up. The system and video shadow is enabled by default, which is great. And under the advanced tab, there's a few things here. I did disable the parallel port just to free up an IRQ, but you can do the same thing for the serial ports if you want. I did disable the uh, diskette controller since there's no floppy in the system. And uh, under advanced, really the only thing you can do here is modify the uh, AT clock. So this is just the divider for the ISA bus. If you do tinker with the uh, FSB frequency, you might need to do that. And PCI devices too, you can specify what IRQs you want uh, to prioritize there for that as well. But aside from that, really not a whole lot else you can set. Oh, one thing I should mention in the security tab. So my BIOS doesn't have a supervisor password, but it looks like a lot of these uh, boundless systems do. Just in case yours does and you want to get in here, the password is lamb key goes. Not sure what that means exactly. Sounds like some kind of a lamb dish. But yeah, really that's all there is here. So I'm just going to save changes and we'll boot this thing up. So at startup, you can see the boot ROM message for the M systems disk on chip, but that's really it. All we get here is a flashing cursor, and that's because these systems have a quote unquote feature where all text output to the screen is suppressed somehow. I assume Boundless did this to prevent people from tinkering around with the system. I mean, after all, it's supposed to be a turnkey thin client. But thankfully, there's a small 88 byte executable that I found on the onboard flash storage called Unsilent. And running this application basically undoes this. It appears that this default text suppression is triggered by the BIOS because not even the BIOS post messages are actually displayed. So I was trying to understand how this unsilent application works, but I don't have a very strong programming background. But I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Linear on Twitter. Linear is famous for her work on the 486 Quake optimizations and is really great with low level hardware code and stuff like that. She took a look at the unsilent application for me and determined that it's really very simple. It just does a BIOS interrupt to the video card with a normally undefined call. It seems to first check if this quote unquote silent feature is supported, and if it is, then it does another call, which presumably does the actual disabling. So, with a better understanding of how the unsilent application works and the calls that it makes, hopefully I'll be able to mod the BIOS at some point in the future. But for now, I'm just going to make sure that it's at the top of autoexec.bat. The only unfortunate bit is that I can't see any output at all from what's being loaded in config.sys. Not really a big deal, just a bit of an annoyance, but uh, I'll add this to the list of projects for another rainy day. All right, so with this thing up and running, let's run a few quick benchmarks to see how it performs. I'm going to be comparing its performance to various CPUs I tested in my 486 gaming rig. It's not really going to be a fair apples to apples comparison because my gaming rig has an older chipset, but it does use a pretty fast Visa local bus card and it's been tuned for best performance. But that said, it'll at least give us an idea how it performs and how much of a performance impact the lack of L2 cache has especially. So first up, we've got some synthetic CPU benchmarks here, and we can see that the boundless system is right on top. <laughs> There's a slight lead in speed sys, but the system information CPU benchmark is just way ahead. And this is really because L1 cache performance has a huge impact on that test, and having right back L1 meet just makes all the difference. And it is great to know that the Viewpoint TC properly makes use of it. Many 486 boards have a pretty flaky or flat out broken implementation of right back caching.
Moving on to memory, we can see that the viewpoint is right at the top again. The L1 bandwidth is just off the charts here because of the right back caching implementation. But interestingly, the memory bandwidth is also way ahead. I think some of this performance is likely due to the right back caching, but I think having EDO versus FPM memory is also playing a bit of a role here too. So synthetic benchmarks are all well and good, but what about a real world game like Doom? Yeah, not quite so spectacular and right in the middle of the pack. I sort of half expected it to outperform the DX4100, but it came up just a little bit short. Some of this will be due to the lack of L2 cache, but I think the VGA card performance here is playing a bigger role. With a 133 MHz 486, Doom isn't going to be as CPU or memory limited. My gaming rig does have a very fast VLB card in it, but the Cyrus Logic GD5446 should do a little bit better than this, I think. If I had to guess, I'd say the PCI bus on this system is tuned more for stability than performance. Some early PCI chipsets had defaults that didn't really provide the best VGA performance and often needed a bit of tweaking. But unfortunately, unless I can modify this BIOS, there just isn't any way to do this. Another bit of data that seems to support this theory is the Visa memory bandwidth figure reported by SpeedSys. My VLB system gets about 20 to 23 megabytes per second, depending on the FSB frequency, but this one only does about 15, which seems a bit low to me. So what about Quake? The game never meant to run on a 46 that everyone just loves to benchmark on 486s. Unlike Doom, Quake is very CPU and especially FPU limited on a 486. We get a very respectable 13 FPS figure here regardless. So despite the lack of L2 cache and a slower video card, gets the exact same score as my gaming rig in write through mode. So not bad. The only benchmark I tried that looked really off is 3D Bench 1.0C. For some reason, the system just totally chokes on it and gets only 13 FPS. But based on all the other benchmarks and games I've tried, this looks more like a bug than some kind of a real performance problem. So I'm just gonna ignore this one. So benchmarks are all well and good, but I'm not building this thing to run benchmarks, am I? May not be the fastest AM5X86 system out there, but it's more than capable of handling even the most demanding DOS games, aside from Quake, of course. But that's enough for the benchmarks. Let's run some games on this thing.
So there you have it, the little beige thin client that could. Just about every game I threw out it ran beautifully, including Duke Nukem 3D. Game which doesn't typically run all that well on your average 486. System's not without its quirks though. The text suppression feature is quite annoying and I think there's still a lot of performance left on the table due to a lack of tuning options. But hey, that's okay. When it comes to gaming, the Viewpoint TC325 has definitely proven itself very capable. I'm not sure what's in store for this thing yet, but uh, I may still add an RTC battery to it and it's really crying out for a BIOS mod, that's for sure. But uh, I'll definitely do a follow-up video if I make any progress in those areas. And uh, also, don't forget to check out the other great 486 build-off videos out there. There's already quite a few posted, and I'm sure there's going to be more in the coming weeks. And if you've got a 486 you'd like to build, upgrade, or showcase, everyone is welcome to participate. I'm not sure if there's an official uh, playlist yet, but you can search for the 486 build-off hashtag both in YouTube and on Twitter. So that's it for today. Thanks very much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like and subscribe. It really does help smaller YouTube channels like mine get more exposure. You can also follow me on Twitter or visit my blog if you'd like to see what other kinds of cool projects I'm up to. And as always, you'll find some links to those in the description. Thanks again.